Next, I'll tell you a little bit about MRD testing in myeloma and other topics, and uh, we'll, we'll cover some, some of the same principles that were being discussed by Dr. Dispensieri. These are my disclosures. If you're interested in, in more uh, information about MRD, I have a YouTube video that I did an interview with Dr. Lanik Kirsch on MRD testing via next generation sequencing for multiple myeloma. Now, we've seen a tremendous improvement in survival for multiple myeloma. This is a study we published already two years ago with close to 10,000 patients using the real world data where you can see on the bottom part in the blue curves what's happening to myeloma survival. And if you actually go even and break those uh, groups by the, the year of diagnosis, the more recent years seem to even do better than past years. And of course, that's not because hematologists are smarter, because we have better tools for the treatment of this disease. And we had to censor the study at the year of 2012, where the majority of these patients have not seen carfilzomib, daratumumab. Uh, so I hope to be able to repeat the study in another 10 years and report an even uh, upward uh, um, escalation of the survival for myeloma patients. Now, we do see that during the first two years, patients do have uh, a high, high risk of, of death, and part of this is because high-risk myeloma, ineffective therapy, comorbid conditions, a number of reasons. But I think a, a big part of all of the story relates to the depth of the response that we can get in multiple myeloma. And uh, while there has been some controversy in the past, I think things are being settled that everything else being equal, getting the deeper response is really the desirable outcome for myeloma clearly in a safe way without added toxicity, but if you were to choose regimens that provide a deeper response for myeloma, you get actually uh, better outcomes. Now, a preview of this was shown by the Spanish study published in 2011 by Dr. Martinez that broke out the outcomes of patients according to the response status post-transplant. In this case, shown in blue are patients who achieved a CR by the definition of the time, and then were followed for uh, 20 years, so very long duration of follow-up, and they find that about 30% of those in a CR remain in a CR at that period of time. Now, I will draw your attention to the red curve, which are patients that had less than a CR, but still a small fraction of them retained evidence of no progression at those same 20 years, a smaller proportion, but still present, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now, we know now, and as you heard from Dr. Dispensieri, that CR and this classification schemes for myeloma responses is really an academic exercise, because when the same Spanish group went down and broke down those patients who have a CR into CRD positive and CRD negative, having a CR with MRD positivity was just almost as good as having a partial response. That's what you see in the middle with all those curves superimposed, and it's only those that are CR MRD negative, shown in green, that appear uh, to be doing uh, better. Now, Dr. LaWertel also published that when you look across the different uh, subtypes and subgroups of the disease, the impact of MRD is there both uh, for progression-free survival and overall survival. And I will draw your attention to uh, the risk reduction, uh, sometimes approximating the point two, which has been shown in subsequent clinical trials. So I would argue that from all of what we know about the various prognostic markers, MRD negativity appears to be one of the most powerful in allowing us to discriminate the outcomes uh, for myeloma patients. I will talk mar more about that in, this, in the specific subsets. Now, MRD testing can be done in multiple ways. I think the European group, and again, uh, primarily driven by the work from the Spanish group, has shown that next generation flow cytometry can be done and can be effective at det detecting uh, uh, very small clones. Um, it, it is technically challenging, but they have been able to standardize this and, and allow the dissemination of their technology so more and more laboratories can actually do this uh, testing. The one advantage that Flow has, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, is that you don't need a baseline sample. So you can, by virtue of the combination of the different dyes, uh, determine the percent of presence of clonal plasma cells. Uh, which is something in next generation sequencing, you do need a baseline uh, testing for the sequence of interest that will be subsequently tracked in future samples. And for that reason, I think of the next generation sequencing exactly like doing you know, fingerprinting for the cell. So essentially it's an unbiased, optimized PCR assay where you actually go and detect the rearrangements in those B cells. And this is usually done with a baseline sample. You can um, you know, take this uh, scraping off from some glass lights know what your sequence is, and then subsequently track that at future time points. This test is a test that has now received FDA approval, and not in, in my particular practice, it's something I do now routinely for patients, both in the post-transplant setting and also in patients who have long-lasting complete responses.
Now, you've seen some of this data. I'll break this down further, but the determination trial has uh, shown, and this is still an evolving trial, and we need additional follow-up, that uh, patients who achieve MRD negativity by whichever uh, treatment arm they were assigned appear to have similar outcomes. That is, patients who had received uh, VRD and achieved MRD negativity appear to have similar outcomes to patients who had a transplant and were negative. Although one of the main arguments, and I will, I will tell this over and over again as I go through my slides, is that what you need to do is choose those treatments that are going to be more likely to put you into that MRD negative status. Now, perhaps one of the most notable examples of how this is evolving is uh, the study that has been presented in preliminary fashion by Dr. Gay from Italy. Uh, she first presented the study at uh, the ASH meeting of 2018 and updated this at the ASCO meeting this year. Now, I'll draw your attention to the far right aspect of this graph. Um, this study compared three arms. Uh, so they compared KCD with transplant with more KCD, kind of a modified cyborg D, if you may. Then they went to a second arm, KRD, then transplant, and then further KRD. And the last arm was just continuous KRD without stem cell transplant. And what is shown on the far right are the outcomes for post-consolidation. And I think a, a few conclusions uh, appear to be coming out from this. One is that the KRD seems to be doing that KCD. We know that. But when you look at the depth of the response, there, they were somewhat similar what you were able to achieve between KRD with or without transplant. Although this was a little bit like a rush test that you know, psychologists apply. If you were a transplanter, you were seeing this. Well, it seems like MRD is a little bit better. Uh, you know, if you look at the transplant arm, and if you don't like transplant, you say they look about the same, right? So there, that's kind of the interpretation that we had. Now, at the ASCO meeting, the update was that the, 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 the durability of those responses appears to be a little bit better with stem cell transplant. I, I personally still think that transplant adds substantially to how we think about long-term control for multiple myeloma. But what you see in the blue is the determination of MRD negativity for patients, which was 54 versus 58%. Now, perhaps one of the most important papers in my mind regarding MRD uh, uh, status in myeloma was published last year by Dr. Perrot from the French group, where they show on the left the effects that it has on progression-free survival, and on the right, on overall survival. The red being, of course, patients who are able to achieve MRD negativity. But now I'm going to draw your attention to the center uh, part of the graph. So they actually go back and look at transplant versus RVD. And what you see in red, again, are MRD negative status. And once more, if you're MRD negative, you do better than if you're positive. But if you're MRD negative, it appears that the MRD negativity that you attain with transplant is a little bit better than the MRD negativity that you achieve with RBD. The same is true if you're positive, the outcome's slightly better with transplant than without transplant. Now, uh, what does this mean? Is there sort of, sort of magic power to transplant? I don't think so. I think it's just that we have a range or an amplitude, if you may, on the MRD negative status in, in, in those, uh, those groups. The same is true when you look at the bottom part of that center, which is MRD and risk status. So again, if you're MRD negative and your standard risk, you have the best outcome. But if you're MRD negative and were determined to be high risk, and this is of course evolving because we're hearing about the biallelic inactivation of P53, but at least as was determined in these clinical trials, your outcomes were better than if you were standard risk and you were MRD positive by a lot, which is shown in the bottom part of the graph. So again, knowing uh, nothing different, I think uh, trying to achieve MRD negativity seems to be a good goal. Even if you don't measure MRD negativity, I think it's something that is moving towards us being able to interpret these trials. But I should warn that MRD negativity has not been yet approved by the FDA as a surrogate marker for drug development. I think it's very clearly prognostic, but we still don't have the incorporation of this into the approval process for future drugs for, for multiple myeloma. Now, one of the very important graphs from, from that particular paper, the Perot paper, if you went to the supplemental materials, one of those things that was hidden there is that whether you achieved MRD negativity at the start of maintenance, which is where you know, we routinely measure this in the clinic, or even 12 months later, it appears that it matters. So this really begs the question, you know, how should we approach a patient that is post-transplant that is still MRD positive? We don't have the clinical trial data, but it's obvious that the like, a pressing question would be, should we be escalating the treatment on those patients? Now, I know we have trials like the stamina and others, but we really need adaptive trials that will be able to, to approach this problem in a dynamic fashion and from the perspective that if you do have residual myeloma post-transplant, 
there may be some value of additional therapy for this patient, so we, so we clearly need those trials. Now, this applies also, of course, for the non-transplant patients. These are the results for the Maya study when you incorporate MRD determination, and what you can see in the top are the outcomes that are MRD negative. So arguably, if you achieve MRD negativity, whether it's with a you know, three-drug combination versus a two-drug combination, it's just as good. So a reasonable hand in the audience would raise and say, well, look at that, that's just biology. And the answer to that is no, it's not just biology. Biology matters, of course. If you achieve MRD negative status with RD, that is great. But if you see the little uh, red box down there, you can see that you're far more likely, about three times more likely to be MRD negative if you get the better treatment. So there is a role for biology, but there's also a very significant, a very important role for what we do with treatment. And remind you, we didn't get MRD negativity with, M, you know, with drugs like MP or VAT, et cetera, so the treatment that you use does matter. Now, similar data was presented with Alcyon, and again, whether it's three drugs versus four drugs, if you're MRD negative, you're doing just as well, but that little pesky red box shows, again, of 25 versus 96% of patients who are able to achieve that MRD negative uh, status for patients. And if you actually even go and look at uh, MRD status in, in the relapse and refractory situation, both the Pollux and the Castor study, you see for the outcomes for patients who are able to achieve MRD negativity are far superior. Now, in this case, the fraction of patients that get into that MRD negative status is, of course, uh, less. You see that in the, in the Castor, there's only six patients, but those appear to have that you know, pretty flat line, just like do those patients in Pollux, which, again, is a very small fraction of the patients in the clinical trial. So um, here's a conceptual slide, and I'll, I'll, I'll build on this. So I think MRD is, is telling us about the depth of the response. And this is, of course, whether you measure it through flow, perhaps in the future with, with mass spec as well, too. So I think it's defining the y-axis boundary for what we should do for multiple myeloma. And I don't have data to present to you today, but I think you will define the x-axis as well, too. Because as we uh, move into the new criteria with IMWG and the ability to have sustained MRD negativity, I think that would allow us to think about this continuation of, of therapy. Now, I personally use this in my practice because if I was to ask this audience and I would raise, ask you to raise your hands, how many of you use maintenance for two years? Perhaps half the audience would say that or one year. The other half would do it indefinitely. But how I bring it into conversation with patients, and, and I'll build more, more into this, is if you have a sustained CR, and perhaps you're having some toxicity, uh, and you're, you know, you're in MRD negative status, you would be more likely to discontinue therapy, which you could have done already if you had seen a doctor who had prescribed, uh, for instance, maintenance for two years. Now, the reason you see that thick boundary, the thick yellow boundary, is just that reminder of that Spanish study with the red curve, that there are some patients that can have a small amount of residual disease and, and perhaps it's not as important to get them into MRD negative status. Uh, the, the reality is we don't know which ones are those patients. We only know that retrospectively. We only know that after you know, years go by, and I'm sure you have patients in your practice. Patients have a small end spike or have a small, percent, uh, a small abnormality in their free light chains, but, but in fact, uh, uh, they, they really don't have any clinical problems. So what I say now is for the treatment of myeloma, and I think MRD will be a big part of this, we need to establish Pax Romana. Through the teachings of, of BART, we learned that very deep responses do matter. I think this is all being uh, supported again by the MRD data. But then in time, you may be able to leave and go and hopefully stop therapy. So the point on that, on that uh, orange line is as follows. So I think there might be a situation where uh, we have to think about MRD negativity differently for different subset of patients, as I alluded already, with, with, with the risk status. And, and from what we know from previous studies from, from, uh, uh, from the University of Arkansas as well, too, it's important to achieve that deep response um, in patients with a complete response. So in high-risk myeloma, maybe the goal should always be to get down to zero. And I think the same goal applies for patients who may not have high risk, uh, uh, but, but perhaps even if you don't get there, you can still envision a good clinical outcome uh, for patients. So, so achieving negativity may be more important in the patient that has high risk disease than in the patient who doesn't. But at the get-go, I would still argue you have to choose regimens that would give you a high degree of MRD negativity. Now, this is a tough conversation because this generates what some have described as MRD anxiety. And, you know, I hope this analogy was mine, but I'll present it to you as I heard it from, from Dr. Hari from Wisconsin. He says, when you think about MRD, you think like sometimes you can tolerate a little bit, right? 
So he says, it's like you have mice in your basement. Maybe it's not ideal, but you can live with that, right? But then if you have bad clones, it's like having a tiger in your basement. It's you're the tiger, right? So there's no, no, no choice there. So hopefully we would know which one of the two it is. And we do have those patients, of course, that do have that low-level disease that can actually do, uh, do very well. So building on my topic, MRD is not everything. It's the only thing based on Lombardi's statement about winning. I, I, I do test it, and I have made the practice of calling my patients when we test for MRD and after they complete their stem cell transplant to notify them of them. This is one of the things that physicians do different. This is part of what physicians do. It's, it's of course, talking to their patients and do the counseling. And I, I certainly let know my patients when they're able to achieve MRD negativity uh, because of the, the significant impact this will have on, on, the, on the status for, for long-term control. Now, there's, of course, uh, many remaining controversies. This is something that, that still is evolving. Of course, certain um, centers would be more prone or more likely to be using flow cytometry. Uh, there is an advantage with flow that you can get the results right away. So that's obviously an, an advantage. And if you were not to have access to the original sample, you could do that with flow, whereas you cannot do that with next generation sequencing. However, uh, the standardization for what you can get with next generation sequencing has allowed us to incorporate that now into, us, into our clinical practice. Now, one of the common complaints I hear is that, well, we don't have phase three trials to be able to start using MRD. And my response to that is we never had phase three clinical trials for the use of the free light chain. And yet we consider it a valuable adjunct in how we interpret uh, biomarkers in, in our own clinical practice for patients with myeloma. Um, the, the big, one of the biggest questions I think is, can this be used to stop therapy? And you're gonna hear a, a range of opinions in this regard. Uh, but again, I would argue if you're in a long-term CR and say you're in maintenance and you, you start getting that toxicity and the patient is experiencing the fatigue or the patient is experiencing the diarrhea and, and they're negative, perhaps they would have a, an extra level of comfort. And I'm not saying this should be 100% determinant, but it's just one more element you can bring into the conversation at the bedside versus if they're positive and they're, you know, they're having some, some, perhaps some toxicity, maybe not, but they want to stay on treatment, I think that would be the reasonable thing to do. And I think a, a, a new aspect that is sort of coming into the conversation is testing for MRD in those patients that you think are still respondent, but who may be technically into a VGPR. And we saw some data about this in the, at the myeloma workshop. And I think sort of in, uh, having uh, the interface between the new methods for testing proteins like mass spec and MRD, EBF flow, or NGS, of course, will be, um, will be very important as we move into the future. Now, MRD, of course, as this design is very specific for the B cells, in this case for the myeloma cells, but an, an alternative would be to look at other mutations, looking at circulating uh, tumor DNA. And, and this is work that is still somewhat early embryonic. Uh, this, the, this work has been uh, pioneered by the group from Toronto and Dr. Kiss and Dr. Trudell, where they show you that if you have a significant number of sequences of uh, circulating tumor cells, you might be able to um, actually uh, be able to detect mutations in the peripheral blood that you know are present in the clone. Uh, perhaps this would be another mechanism for, for uh, measurement of MRD. But the one thing we know, and this applies both for mutations as well as for, for MRD testing by other methods, is that if you test the blood, you seem to be about one log different from what uh, you get if you go and you directly test the bone marrow when it comes down to these two methods of, of, of detection. So uh, I know there's great excitement when we talk about circulating tumor DNA and certainly about uh, peripheral blood MRD. But the reality, if the sensitivity becomes the driving factor, as of now, testing directly in the bone marrow appears to be the way to go. And with that, I think I will conclude. Thank you for your attention. This image is not mine. I can, if you're in the audience and this was yours, please let me know. But I just love the, the finger showing the protein electrophoresis. So thank you very much. <laughs>